someone once said to Winston Churchill, uh, praising one of his arch enemies, Clement Attlee, Prime Minister of England, uh, they once said to Winston that, you must admit, however, he is a very humble person. And Churchill said, he has much about which to be humble. <laughs> so uh, I think probably the same is true here. Anyway, the subject of free will, Groucho Marx once commented that, uh, he said, we have to believe in free will. What choice do we have? <laughs> So you've studied some of, the, uh, some of the sources about free will. Of course, I should point out that what you have seen in terms of these sources are really just the tip of the Goldberg, uh, sorry, tip of the iceberg of the sources about free will. And there is a really a vast amount of literature uh, in uh, Jewish tradition, entire, <laughs> entire books, uh, entire treaties uh, about the subject of free will. Uh, very, very complex and deep subject. As you probably saw, let me start with the necessity for free will. Uh, this is like uh, doing all the, this is a ringing sound here. Is that, is that me or is this ringing? It's a little feedback. It's feedback. Yeah, it's very annoying. Yeah. Um, no, it's too close to the speaker. Yeah, this, it's a speaker. It's got feedback from the speaker. Can we? How's that? Yeah, that's better. Okay, fine. Yep, it's good now. Let's first talk about the necessity of free will. As you probably saw in the sources, there are two sources that discuss the necessity of free will from a, from a Jewish perspective. One of them is Rav Moshe Chaim Lozato, the great Italian Jewish Kabbalist, and the other is the Magid Meisharim, a book written by Rav Yosef Karo, the author of the Code of Jewish Law in Sfat, Safford, in the 17th century. And what they say basically is the following. Uh, and this is really heavily condensed. But basically, the, as far as we can understand, God created the world in order to bestow good upon humanity. God is the perfect goodness. He is the perfectly good being. And as Ramosha Khan Lozato points out, it is the way of the perfectly good to give. Derech hatov lehetiv. It is the way of the good to give. Perfect goodness means giving. That's axiomatic. So God wants to give. He creates beings to whom he can give. Those are us. Beings to whom he can give. What is the ultimate gift, the ultimate good, the most greatest perfect good that God can give to these creatures? What's the answer? Self. Himself, because he is the perfect good. How can he give himself to us? What it means is that he gives us an opportunity to have a relationship with God. That's the closest you can get. If you are in love with someone, you want to give yourself to that person. Okay, so you can't what, how do you give yourself to that person. How do you give yourself to a person? The answer is you have a relationship with that person. You have a loving, caring, close relationship with that person. In as much as that is so, the ultimate good that God wants to bestow upon us is himself. And that is why he created us. That is why he created the world. The problem is, and this is something which is addressed by, you may have seen this, Reb Yosef Karo. Um, by the way, the, the, the book from which I quoted by Reb Yosef Karo, I think you have it on the source sheet, it's called Magid Meisharim. Tradition has it, you don't have to believe this, but it is a tradition that the book is composed of lessons that he was taught on a weekly basis by an angel. That an angel would come to Yosef Kara, author of the Code of Jewish Law, and teach him a lesson about the weekly portion every week. And he wrote down the lessons, recorded them, in a book called Magid Meisharim, which means the, the teacher or the, the speaker who is upright and straightforward. So that's what the origin of the book is. You could uh, take that uh, uh, as you want, but that's the, that's the tradition about that book. In any case, the question he asks is, so if God wants to give... If God wants to give us a relationship with himself, why does he have to create a physical world with all that that involves? With all the challenges and the tragedies and the trials and tribulations of a physical world? Why does that have to be necessary? Why not just create these souls who already have a relationship with God, disembodied spiritual entities, Q. 
right? right? The, these entities that have a relationship with God, and that's it. Why do we have to? Why, why do this? You know, imagine, you know, it's my birthday. It's not, well, November. Okay, so you missed it this time. But imagine you come over to me and you say, Mordecai, I, I remember it's your birthday, and I'd like to give you a present. So you hand me a small, beautifully wrapped box. I look at the box, I say, well, you know, you're thinking to yourself, it's, it's all the old moral dilemma. Do you open it in front of the person and then have to hide your disappointment, right? Or do you not open it, in which case you are basically saying that you don't really trust their choice of gift. That's why you're not opening it in front of them, so you don't want to have to hide your disappointment, in which case you anyway insult them. It's, it's, a, it's a moral dilemma discussed by Immanuel Kant. Anyway, so, um, but, so you decide you'll open it. So you rip open the wrapping paper. I always like ripping wrapping paper because when I was a little kid, my mother would never let me rip the wrapping paper. Don't tear the wrapping paper, right? Because we're going to reuse it, obviously, right? It's not for ecological consciousness, I assure you. Anyway, so, uh, so now I just buy rolls of it and just tear it apart. It's like mortify the Passaic <laughs> ripper. Anyway, so, um, so you open up the box, and inside is a key. Nice, polished key. And I say, you got me a key, thank you very much. It's really tried to hide your disappointment. He says, no, 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 that's not the present. That's not the present. Right? This is a key to a safety deposit box. And in the safety deposit box, that is where your present is. I say, oh, cool. Now I say, thank you a little more sincerely. And I say, where is the bank? He says, in um, Grozny. I say, Grozny? Is that not in Chechnya? War-torn, terrorist-ridden, Chechnya? He said, yes. I said, how the heck do I get to there? He says, well, you take a f commercial flight to Sheremetyevo Airport in Moscow, and from there you get Air Chechnya <laughs> to Grozny Airport. I said, oh, my God. You know, it's one of those airlines where it doesn't matter where you land, even if it's not Israel, you will kiss the ground. <laughs> so, so I said, okay, you get Air Chechnya to, the air to, to you know, Grozny Airport, and he says, yeah, the airport's like 30 kilometers from the bank. I said, okay, it's not that far. He said, the problem is the first 10 kilometers is patrolled by Spetsnaz. I said, what is Spetsnaz? Spetsnaz are elite Russian commandos who have not been paid for three years. <laughs> I said, oh, that sounds great. I, I said, and the next 10 kilometers? Next 10 kilometers, no Spetsnaz whatsoever. That's where the Islamic fundamentalist terrorists are. That's, I said, oh, that's great. And I said, and the next 10? He says, the next 10, no Muslims. No Spetsnaz. I said, what's the next 10? He says, the Russian Mafia. Worse than both put together. And he says, oh, and by the way, I don't remember which way you turn the key, but if you turn it the wrong way, it's booby-trapped. It's going to blow up. Now, what type of maniac gives you a present like that? I would say, next time, you know what? I don't want a present. Just send me one of those animated cards, email, right? <laughs> Where, you know, where Kermit says, happy birthday, Mordechai, and then infects your computer with a virus. That type of thing. Right? Much prefer that than having to slog through to Chechnya. So what is the idea here? So uh, the answer given by Magid Meisharim, Rabbi Yosef Karo, the answer is two words. What are the two words? In Aramaic, Nahama de Kisufa, bread of shame. What he says is, uh, the angel says to Rabbi Yosef Karo, God does not want us to eat bread of shame. He wants us to, 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 to reap the reward of our labor. He wants us to earn our reward so it should not be bread of shame. The difference between getting a handout, a food stamp, a, 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 a welfare check, etc., versus earning your money by doing a job that is important, that is meaningful, and getting the money for it. That's the difference. He gave us a job in this world by which we can earn that money. The way Ramosh Chaim Lozato puts it, which I have quoted in the source sheets there, Ramosh Chaim Lozato puts it a little differently, but it's the same idea. He says, he wanted she baal she he baal He wanted the receiver of this good to be the true owner of it. And you are only really the true owner of something when you have earned it. Okay, now, so far so good, but there's a problem. The problem, asked by a number of great scholars, Leshem, Rav Shlomo Yashiv, great Kabbalist from the uh, 20th century, early 20th century, um, he asked the question, but surely, did not God create this feeling of dignity? Did not God create the whole idea of shame? If he would just eliminate shame from our personalities, there would not be a need 
to earn our keep. We'd be just as happy with a gift that we didn't earn as one which we did earn. You hear the problem, folks? Following, right? In other words, they've answered a question, but that raises another more uh, deeper question. This idea that we should own or earn our good, the idea that it's bred of shame when we just get the handout without having earned it, what, why should it be so? Is it not so because God created it so? Don't create it so. You know, as you create the problem, then you create the world with all the struggles in order to get around the problem. Don't create the problem in the first place. So the answer here, Rav Moshe Chaim Lozato gives a little deeper, is the following. Remember, the greatest good is a relationship with God. But relationship means, what does relationship mean? Does not relationship mean compatibility? Similarity? When we talk about closeness, you're close to someone. There are people I feel close to, even though I live thousands of miles away from them. I'm not geographically close to them. What do I mean by close to them? We have a wonderful relationship. We have a wonderful relationship. We have a, right, there's, there's a similarity, there's a compatibility, we have common ideals, we have common goals. There's a tremendous amount. That's what it means. In order to have that closeness of a relationship with God, what it means really is being similar to God, being God-like, being similar to God. That's the essence of what it means. The reason that we have to earn the good is the reason that we want the good to be come through struggle of free will, that God wants it to be that way, is so that whatever good we have, whatever similarity to God we have, is, is internal. Because you see, God, there is nothing outside of God. There's nothing outside of God, which means everything that God is comes from where? Outside or inside? From within, clearly. For us, if God would create us already perfect, create us already good, would we be similar to God or would we be actually dissimilar? We'd be completely dissimilar because all the good, all of our similarity would come from outside of ourselves. We would be totally dissimilar to God. We'd be as similar to God as a rock. Right? A rock is not similar to God. A rock is a rock because God made it that way. Something is, anything's like that. But the human being is different. The human being has to create the self. We have to create ourselves. And by creating ourselves, therefore, uh, uh, so to speak, the goodness, the similarity comes from within, not from our, obviously, we're not 100% like God. We cannot be like, we cannot be God. But as similar as possible. So the way in which we become similar to God, the way in which we can be God-like, is by being in a situation in which we make choices about good and evil. We make choices between righteousness and evil. We make choices between purity and impurity. And the choice comes from within us. And when I choose that way, and I choose to be good, i.e. God-like, then I become more and more similar to God. And there, the great joy of a relationship with God is only when there's compatibility. Beings who are not compatible, there is no joy in being close. There's no joy in that relationship. You know, I, I remember in a uh, long time ago, um, competition Coca-Cola had. You open the Coke bottle, you look inside the lid, right? It says, did I mention this last time? I don't remember. Right, you look inside the lid. No, no, I don't remember if I've talked about it. No, but uh, it was a different class, right? So um, inside the lid, it said, it said a winning code word, or it says, try again. I actually had a guy at my house once. He opens a Coke bottle. He looks inside. It says, try again. So he closes it. He opens it. It's <laughs> just like, dude, this is not working. Anyway, so, um, so the winning, the first prize was one week touring with the Beastie Boys. One week touring with the Beastie Boys. That's a musical group for those who are not familiar with the finer part of life. Right? So, so you got a week with the Beastie Boys. Okay? And uh, I assume second prize was two weeks. But anyway, the... Um, <laughs> so I'm thinking at the time... Right? You imagine, you know, I, I have the bizarre imagine. I'm thinking to myself, imagine the Berlin Philharmonic is playing in New York, conducted by the great Nazi, uh, German conductor Herbert von Karajan. So Herbert von Karajan conducting the Berlin Philharmonic, after he finishes this Beethoven concert, he goose steps over to the Coke machine, feeds in some Deutschmarks, right? He takes out a Coke, he looks at the cap, he says, so, I have won the competition. He looks at the side of the thing and says, Van Vick, meet the Beastie Boys. <laughs> Let me ask you a simple question. 
Herbert von Karajan, conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic, spending a week with the Beastie Boys. First prize or Gehinnom? <laughs> the answer is B, right? Because there's no compatibility. So what really Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lozato and Rabbi Yosef Kara are saying is that the idea of free will is so central to existence because it is the means by which we, so to speak, become independent, self-created, right, God-like beings. And it is only through that. Because if it were any other way, if we were created good, we wouldn't be good. Doesn't that make sense, right? If we were created good, not good. If you were, if you were pre-programmed to be good, you're not good. If you were pre-programmed to be evil, you're not evil. It is only if you choose to be good that you're good, and if you choose to be evil, you're evil. And it's only when you choose that way to be good, that's when you are like God. Because then you have a pure ratson, the pure will to do, to, to do that good. So that's why it's so central. And, and obviously we know that morality, absolute morality, the idea of there being a good and evil is only possible if there's free will. You cannot really condemn someone for being evil if they don't have free If you don't believe that person has free will, there's absolutely no difference morally between a terrorist who does the bombing and the emergency worker who saves people from that bombing. Right? Because if you don't believe in free will, they're basically the same. No, one is pre-programmed because of genetics and environment and so on and so forth uh, that he is a, he's a killer. And the other is pre-programmed. You know, he was brought into an Irish police family, so you know, he's, he's brave, he's macho, he runs into the building, doesn't think... He's pre-programmed, that's it. He's not good. So uh, usually, of course, the way it works is that we, we expect... We, got, we, we excuse ourselves because we're pre-programmed for the bad stuff, but we still want to be praised for the good. You know, we're never, we're never totally even on that, right? So, uh, but, the way, but, it, but it goes both ways. It has to be that way. So that is the presence of free will. How important is free will? Maimonides says, of course, that's central. It's one of the foundations of foundations of Judaism, is the idea that every person can turn themselves to the side of good and be righteous. It can be evil. And that is within the power of the human being. Um, incidentally, there's a fascinating, I don't know if I put it into the, in the source sheet, there's Maimonides comments that he says, he says that, you know, the Mishnah says in Ethics of the Fathers, did we put that in? The Mishnah says that uh, every hakol lefi rov hama'aseh, everything is according to the abundance of the action. Did you, that, that's on the source sheet? So Maimonides says what that means is that it's much preferable to do many, many different acts of goodness rather than one gigantic act. And what's the reason? He doesn't totally explain it. Maimonides is a little ambiguous about what the reasoning is, but the reason is the following. Because you see, one act, one fantastic act of greatness is one act of free will. But a hundred acts of good, that's a hundred free will decisions to do the right thing. Which is going to have a greater impact on the personality? A hundred decisions to do good or one decision to do good? I think clearly a hundred decisions to do good. There can be exceptions, depending on the, if the act of doing good is just so heroic and exceptional that it's beyond... The, but, but in the standard course of events, right, we would say that free will is central there because that's the moulding of the human being. As Reba McIntyre, I think it was, who said... She's a, uh, a philosopher from the southern United States. Um, put it this way, I think it's her. She said, you are your own child, don't forget to be good. It's never too late to have a good childhood. I'll translate. You are your own child. Don't forget to be good. It's never too late to have a good childhood. You, what, do you mean, what does she mean, you are your own child? She's no doubt referring here to the Ramchal, right? Which is that through our free will, we actually create ourselves. We are the person, we create, we give birth to the person, that explains my cravings, but we give birth, we are, we are pregnant, so to speak, with the, with the future self, right? And our decisions that we make will create who I am next week, next year, next decade, and next world as well. So that is the centrality of free will. Now, it is so central uh, that there are some who maintain that God gave humans such incredible power of free will that the free will of one person can actually control the fate of another person. The case of Joseph, and no doubt you saw that. That was in the, uh, that was in the outline, right? Joseph? Okay. So Joseph walks into a place called Dotan, in his technicolor dream coat, and the brothers, right, say, let's kill him. 
and I'm not going to go into the reasons the brothers wanted to kill him. Uh, there is, there's a lot of discussion about this. It wasn't simply, it wasn't like some gangland, you know, the guy's got a, got a cool jacket. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to, you know, they're going to pop him in order to get the jacket. It's like, that's not, right, we're talking about people who God spoke to, you know, I mean, they were not, right, so, but according to the letter of Hirsch says, they felt that Joseph, with his dreams of monarchy, was a danger to the Jewish people. The Jewish people should not be a monarchy, they felt. Because a monarchy, all the monarchies that ha they'd have contact with, all were evil totalitarian dictatorships. They were all like kingdoms of evil. You know, they, they encountered Nimrod. They encountered Avimelech of the Philistines. They encountered Pharaoh. They said, Joseph, with his dreams of monarchy, is going to drag the Jewish people from being this elevated spiritual people to this, like, this looks like any other, right, any other nation. Right, we'll just want to conquer. We'll want to, we'll want to expand our territory. Just this, that's bit power. They felt that was a danger. Be that as it may, it's not important why they wanted to kill him. But they did want to kill him. They felt that he was evil. And his dreams were dangerous, and they decided they'd kill him. What happens? One of the brothers, Reuven, says, and this is the Torah says, you should have noticed these words, Vayishma Reuven v'yatzilehu miyadam. Reuven heard, and Reuven saved him from their hands. Reuven, the Torah testifies that Reuven saved him. Does it not? How did Reuven save Joseph? What did Reuven say? Don't kill him. What did what you do instead? Throw him in the pit. What was in the pit? The Torah says the pit was empty of water. So if you describe a pit as empty of water, what has it gotten at most likely? Yeah, it's, it's in, I've been to Dotan, this place. Right? I did basic training there in the Israeli army, Dotan. Right? Uh, snakes and scorpions. There are snakes and scorpions. But again, right, the, so, so Reuven says don't kill him, throw him in the pit with the snakes and scorpions. Let me ask anyone a question here. Please raise your hand. Anyone who would like to be saved by Reuven, please raise your hand. <laughs> huh? No? No volunteers? Our hero? Don't kill him quickly. Chuck him in the pit with the snakes and scorpions. Let him die of dehydration. Right, scorpion sting, snake bite, contusions, abrasions, right, uh, you know, uh, heat exhaustion, right, uh, etc., etc. Right, I mean, what, what, what the heck, what's going on here? How is that? And yet, the Torah itself testifies that Ruvain saved him from their hands. So the answer, not the answer, an answer, as you might imagine, this may come as a shock to you, but there's an argument about this. Yeah, the argument about this, right? I, I, I know this is very, this is disturbing, but yes, there are, there's actually arguments in Judaism. Right, so, but it says this, the Zohar, the Zohar, which is, of course, the great Jewish mystical text written by Yochai. Do not mess with the Zohar. It's of great sanctity. Um, so the Zohar says the following. The Zohar says that, um, that a person should always pray that they fall into a snake pit rather than fall into the hands of their enemies. Because the snake pit, they are not agents of free will. And therefore, for God to intervene in the snake is a minor intervention, what we call a hidden miracle, regular divine providence. A human being, an enemy, is a free will agent. For God to intervene in the free will of a human being is a massive intervention in the world and in the purpose of creation. To, 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 that requires, and that's called an open miracle. That requires tremendous merit. To be saved from the snake, all you need to be is innocent. To be saved from a human, you don't need to, innocence is not enough. You need tremendous merit. Because a human's a free will agent. Does this, under, does this make sense? So the Zohar says, this is what Ruven was saying. Ruven says, no, don't you guys kill him. Because if you do it, God, even, though, even if Joseph is innocent, God may not intervene. He may let him die because you people have free will. Throw him in the pit. If Joseph is innocent, he'll survive. Divine providence. Tremendous thing. The Or HaChaim, Reb Chaim Ibn Atar, quotes the Zohar on that place as well. And he maintains the same idea. And there's further evidence. So, so is this clear? I just want to make this clear, right? Joseph was a righteous person. He was innocent. He did not deserve to die. But what Reuven, what the Zohar rather is saying is that had the brothers made a free will decision to kill Joseph, it could be that God would have let that happen so as not to intervene in human free will. Think of it in the following way. Imagine if every time 
a person is, an innocent person is going to suffer or a righteous person is going to prosper, God intervenes. What type of world would it be? Every time you cheat in cards, you lose. Every time you're honest, you win. Every time you are courteous in driving, you get to your parking space and you get to the place on time. Every time you're obnoxious, you get there late. Every time you are, no, you are nice and generous in your business dealings, you get the contract. Every time you are nasty and mean, you lose it. What type of world would that, you know what that world would be like? Go around the corner here to the psychology lab and you will see a Skinner maze. That's a little maze where they have rats. They shouldn't, you shouldn't call them rats. My wife teaches psychology, says the politically correct term is non-human animal research participants. <laughs> <laughs> so the non-human animal research participants are running around the Skinner maze. They press a lever and they get food pellets. They press the wrong lever, they get bipolar electroconvulsive therapy. <laughs> Unpleasant, I've been told. I don't remember really. Anyway, but I'm saying the, the idea here is that God does not want us to be rats in a Skinner maze, right? So he creates a world in which, yeah, there is human free will, has, has a vast power. That is, the, that is what the Zohar is saying. And there's further evidence of this. The source uh, from the book of Samuel, Samuel 2, chapter 24, you saw that? So what happens there? This is a verse that we say many, many days of the week, most days of the week. It's in the morning service. Right? The verse says, and King David said to God, God, not God, but God, his name of the prophet. He said to God, this is terribly distressing to me. Let me fall into the hands of God whose mercy is abundant, but not into the hands of man. The context here is King David committed a sin. He did a count, a census of the Jewish people, which was for, for various reasons not supposed to do. And God gives him the prophet. God sends a prophet, God, I'm confusing God and God. Hashem sends a prophet, God, to King David, and he says, we'll offer you a choice here. Plague, famine, or fall into the hands of your enemies. King David says, Vayomer David, oh God. David says to God, Sarli ma'od, this is really painful. What a type of choice. Terrible. But in the end, what does King David say? Nipla na biyad Hashem, ki rabim rachmav, let me fall into the hands of God plague, famine, because his mercy is abundant, but into the hands of a human? No way. Don't let me fall. What's the implication here? What is the implication? That falling into the hands of man is not falling into the hands of God. Falling into the hands of the human being is worse because God is not controlling the hands of the human being. It is his free will. And human beings are capable of... So, so that's what we're saying. Don't, you don't want to fall into the hands of your enemies. That is the opinion of the Zohar and the Orachaim. Indeed, this seems to be also implied. Did we put the Mishnah in Sanhedrin 37a? Yeah. So the Mishnah in Sanhedrin implies a similar idea. The Mishnah says that you're supposed to threaten... Uh, witness. In other words, the court is supposed to give a stern warning. To, I think in secular courts they do that as well, whatever. You know, the judge gives a stern warning to the witnesses. Right? What's the warning? He says, if the, in a monetary case, he says, if you make a mistake or if you perjure yourself, it's money. You can pay it back. Everything's fine. But if you perjure or make a mistake in a matter of a capital crime, then what does it say? It says, cold, it says, then the blood of this person and his children and all the children that he could have had is on your head. And we learn this from Cain and Abel, Cain and Hevel, where God says to, to Cain after he's killed Abel, he says, the, vo the, the, the voice of the bloods of your brother are crying to me from the ground. Called Demeachecha. What does that mean, the bloods? It means his blood and the blood of his future children, which you prevented from being born. question we have to ask is, if it was preordained, if it was part of the divine plan that he should die, then there are no future children. Right? There's no future children. It was, right? God, God made a decision. This guy will die before he has children. So there are no future children. So what are you responsible for future children for? What are we telling the witnesses? Makes no sense. If you say that human free will can have an impact, then it makes sense what we're telling the witnesses. If you say it can I have an impact, then it doesn't make sense what we're telling the witnesses. Is this clear so far? Okay, so that is the opinion of the Zohar and Reb Chaim Ibn Attar and various other uh, rabbis. However, as I said, not everyone agrees with this. Rabbeinu Bachya, author of the famous Chovot Halvavot, Duties of the Heart, 
one of the great classics of Jewish ethics and philosophy, disagrees, and he says, an evil person cannot harm the hair on the head of a righteous person unless it's decreed by God. The Sefer HaChinuch, the book of mitzvah education, which I believe you have on your source sheet, in mitzvah 241, discusses the idea. This is the prohibition against revenge. According to Torah law, you're not allowed to take revenge. But I should point out, this doesn't mean you cannot defend yourself. If, God forbid, someone hits you, obviously, right, in, at the moment of that, you're allowed to defend yourself, you're allowed to hit them back, you're allowed to insult them back, right? It's, not, it's, 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 it's self-defense at this point. It's, it's impossible to expect a person to be a stone that can just be kicked around, right? It's not, right. However, we're talking about after the fact, some say it means only in monetary areas, not if there's bodily injury involved, but I'm not going to get into the details of that. The basic gist of it is that you should not take revenge and don't bear a grudge. There's two ideas, taking revenge, bearing a grudge. Taking revenge means this. Someone comes to you in uh, last autumn and says, can I borrow your leaf blower? And I say, I'm sorry, I don't lend out my power tools. It's just a, it's a thing. I, I'm sorry. Really, I'd love to, but I don't lend out power tools. Then... Two weeks ago, I come to this guy, and I said, can I borrow your, your snowblower? And he says, you didn't lend me your leaf blower. I'm not going to lend you my snowblower. Yeah. <laughs> that is called taking revenge. No, don't do that. Bearing a grudge is a little different. Bearing a grudge is, same scenario, I come to him, I say, can I please borrow your snowblower? And he says, of course, I think I'm like you. <laughs> so that's called bearing a grudge. He does, he lends it to you, but, you know, I'm not like you, right? So anyway, so we have a prohibition against taking revenge. So the Sefer HaChinuch explains what's the idea here. So he says this, because a person has to know that everything that happens to him, whether good or bad, is a decree, is a, the reason for it is a decree of God that it should happen to him. He says nothing can happen due to the other person unless God decrees that it be so. Therefore, when the other person causes you pain, or suffering, you should know that it's your sins that allowed that to happen, that caused that to happen, and God decreed that on you. So therefore, don't place your thoughts upon taking revenge from this other guy, because he's not the reason for it. It's you who are the reason for it. Now, this doesn't detract from the other guy's guilt, because the other guy made a decision to throw a stone at you. Okay, That's an evil decision, and he gets punished for that. But the fact that the stone hit you, right, that you didn't bend down at the right moment or that someone else didn't walk in front of it, that's divine providence and that is because of your sin. So the Sefer HaChinuch is saying, so there's, there's a guilt in both ways, right? So he's saying, and therefore, the, if we really understood this, this would resolve so many problems for us personally, emotionally, etc. So does the Sefer HaChinuch agree with the Zohar? Does he agree with the Zohar? Certainly not. Certainly not. What he is saying here is that the, the person is, and, and by the way, according to him, you'd have to say that the person is only actually uh, punished really for the decision, not for the outcome. The outcome is, 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 is preordained in some sense. It's, it's divine providence. It's a decision for which they're evil. This, by the way, is an interesting solution to one of the questions about, uh, about, about divine providence versus free will. Right, I'll give you the exact. This is a this answer I heard from Rabbi Gottlieb, uh, which is actually a combination of of, of uh, David Hume. Um, I believe it's a combination of David Hume and Rabbi Hanan Wasserman and uh, Rabbi David Gottlieb. So it's the Hume Wasserman Gottlieb hypothesis, is what we'll call it for the moment. Right, like this. Let's say you're on a business trip, and uh, you go into the hotel, into your hotel room, and unbeknown to you, when the hotel door closes behind you, it's five o'clock. Hotel hall door closed behind you. It actually jammed. It's broken. The door's broke. The lock's broken. It closed. It closed. And you walked into the room. Unbeknown to you, you are now locked into the room. It will take the hotel at least an hour. Half an hour to get a locksmith. Another half an hour to open the door. You are locked in that room for one hour, whether you like it or not. But you don't know this. Is, is this clear? Okay. Five minutes later, the phone rings. Your cell phone rings. It's your best friend. Close friend. Not your best. Close friend. He says, Mordechai, I heard you're in town. I said, yeah, yeah, I'm just, uh, I just had a lot of meetings today. I'm trying to relax in the hotel room, you know, right? So, uh, so he says, listen, please, save my life. I said, what are you talking about? He says, I borrowed money from some loan sharks. Right? I said, if I don't pay them back by 5.30 tonight, they're going to beat me to a pulp. I said, so what's your point? He said, what do you mean, what's my point? 
right? Could you please give me the money? Right, I'll come to the hotel, I'll pick it up from you, just please give me a check, I'll pay them, I'll hold them off for a little bit, I'll, it'll save my life, who knows what they're going to do to me. I say, look, it's, uh, how much do you need? He says, 5,000 bucks. I say, that's a lot of money, man. That's a lot of money. He says, my life. I say, yeah, but still. still. <laughs> it's, not, it's a lot of money. 5,000 bucks, today's economy. Right, they may not kill you, they may just beat you up. <laughs> he says, oh, come on, please swear to me. I say, fine, fine, fine. He says, I'll come over 515 just come downstairs and, and come downstairs and bring me, the, uh, bring me the money. I said, fine, okay. He says, please swear to me. I said, oh, I have to. He said, come on. I said, okay, fine. Right. So anyway, I put down the phone and uh, I, you know, I, I sit down and I'm reading my uh, Ayn Rand. And, um, you know, and as I uh, keep reading and I'm thinking to myself, I don't think it's a good idea for me to give this to him. I mean, he's just going to become this, like, slug-like dependent, right? It's actually much better for him to be independent, to deal with the consequences of his actions, right? To be a real person, real man. I mean, what, I mean, uh, and on the contrary, I'm just... I mean, if he borrowed from loan sharks and he's not going to pay them back, why on earth will he pay me back, right? They're threatening to be into a pulp, and in the last half an hour, he decides to get money from me. What? The chances of me getting this money back is zero, <laughs> right? So I decide... Forget it. I'm not going to give him the money. I turn off my cell phone. I unplug the room of the phone, the phone in the room. As I phone the front desk, I please, I do not want to be disturbed by anyone for anything for the next hour. Thank you. And they say, okay, sir. I unplug the phone, right? And I settle down for a nice read. Anyway, 5.15, I hear some screams from downstairs, faint screams. Then I hear sirens, ambulance, police. <laughs> I turn up the volume on the television. It's a little disturbing, you know, the screaming, the sirens. Anyway, after about an hour, I decide I'll go down to the bar and have a rusty nail. Right, so, uh, Drambuian single malt, by the way. Anyway, so uh, I go down to the, I, I go to the door of the room, it's five to six. Open the door. It's jammed. And I, I determine the door is jammed. I am trapped in here. I phone the front desk, they say, yes, so it's going to take at least half an hour to get, the, to get a locksmith, probably another half an hour to work on the door. Okay, so we're really sorry, we'll refund you the money in the room. And I say, this is awesome. This is fantastic. A, I've got my $5,000, and B, I'm at Sadiq. I'm totally righteous. Why? Because even had I decided to bring the money to him, I couldn't have gotten it to him in time. Which means, he would have gotten beaten up anyway, which means... I am a totally righteous person. What would you say? Am I indeed righteous? No, no, I mean, not in real life. I know I am. <laughs> right? But I'm saying, uh, and, hu and humble as well, not to forget that. Right? So, but I'm saying in the story, am I in fact righteous? Or am I a lethal lowlife? A creep? Uh -huh. <laughs> right? He's a creep! Right? What did he, he reneged on it. However, interestingly enough here, this is Robert Hanna Vassman says, but here's a case, will he get punished for the consequences or is he punished for the decision? What are you punished for? The consequences or the decision? The decision. The consequences are not yours. It's the decision. However, it could be, and this might be a resolution of the Mishnah in Sanhedrin with the views of the Sefer Achinuch, that might be the resolution because it could be that God looks at it since, since you didn't know that the consequences would not happen. As far as you are concerned, he is going to get beaten to a pulp and you made the decision anyway. God may punish you as if you cause the consequences. So therefore, that might not be evidence against the Sefer HaChinuch's view. Is this clear? Rav Eliyahu Eliezer Desla uh, suggests also that it could be that the views are not so far apart. That the Zohar, on the one hand, and the Sefer HaChinuch on the other hand, in other words, the extreme power of free will view, the Zohar, and the extreme divine providence view, Sefer HaChinuch, may not be so far apart. What Rav Dessa says is it could be the following. It could be that, you see, it's not an arbitrary fact that you are under the control of per the other person's free will. Was it arbitrary and random that Joseph was suddenly under the control of his brothers? Or was that something which divine providence ordained? So what Rav Dessa says is this. God, this is very interesting, he says this. God may have decreed that person A 
that the punishment or reward for person A is that he'll be under the control of the free will of person B. Is it random then that he's under the control of person B? That's not random at all. That's God's divine judgment. That's his prop, divine providence. However, once he decided that you're under the control of person B, does person's B decision have an impact on you? Of course it does. Because God put you under the control of person B. So it's a combat, it is what, this is a synthesis. This is what we call the, the Desler Chinuch synthesis. Right? As opposed to the Hume, Gottlieb, Wasserman hypothesis. This is the Desler Chinuch synthesis. Okay? Um, which is the following. That may be, right? You see, because otherwise it's very disturbing. If we just leave it with the Zohar, then it appears the world appears to be a random place. Very frightening. And doesn't make sense, because according to the Torah, we see God's divine providence continuously in the Torah. So, there's, so what Abdesha is saying is there's a balance between God's divine providence and human free will. God determines when and if someone will be under the control of the other person's free will. And, but once he determines that they'll be under the control of that person's free will, then indeed that person's free will has tremendous power. Has tremendous, tremendous power and, of course, tremendous tragedy. So that is a, a bit of a, a solution uh, to, that, to that argument, which makes it not so much of an argument as, as it was in the first place. Okay? So those are a few of the ideas behind, the, behind free will, which, you've, which we've covered. Um, I'd to mention one or two more, one or two more things which I, think, which I think might be important to, to point out. Which is this. So people often ask, and this is a big mistake, people often, I, I often have this question asked, they say, how can you say we have free will? God has told us in the Torah, this is wrong, this is right, this is evil, this is good. If you do this, you get punished. If you do this, you get rewarded. So where's their free will? I'm obligated to do this. I have to do this. I, I cannot, I'm not allowed to do that. So here the mistake, I know it's a, it's a silly question, but the mistake is basically this. They're confusing, this is where Dobby Gottlieb puts it, they're confusing free will authority with free will ability. Free will, the fact that we have free will doesn't mean we have authority. It means we have ability. That is to say, the person who asked this question is assuming that free will means that whatever I choose is fine, because I chose it. That's the standard view in modern-day United States, by the way. Right? Which is that if, a, that if a person makes a free will decision and they're sincere about it, what more can you want? Now, obviously, that's moronic, isn't it? Right? Imagine, I, I, remember, I remember I was, I was at a lecture and someone mentioned this idea. That someone, someone mentioned some, this, the lecturer criticized some person and someone in the audience said, yes, but he's so sincere. And another person in the audience stood up and he says, I'm a Holocaust survivor. I survived because I found an insincere Nazi that I could bribe. Had he been sincere, he wouldn't have accepted a bribe from a Jew. But he was insincere. Sincerity is a wonderful thing if it's in the right area. It's not a wonderful thing, it's in the wrong area. The fact that I've chosen something doesn't mean automatically make it good. I could choose evil. There is an objective good and evil. The objective good and evil, we believe, is determined by God. The choice to act in that good or to act evil, that is our choice. We have an ability to choose. We have the authority to make something good or make it evil that's God's authority, that's God's, that's God's power but we have the ability to choose between an objective good and evil that already exists so that's, a, that's a, another a, a important point um, and uh, one more point if uh, and this I don't really have an answer to um, which is that, and, uh, you know, that, that God has uh, if God knows everything that's going to happen then, and he cannot be wrong about it, then how is it possible for me to have free will? Right? Are you saying that I could have chosen X? Well, God knew that I'd choose X. Right? If God knew that I'd choose X and God cannot be wrong, that means there was no possibility of my choosing Y. Okay? So there's a number of responses to this. Maimonides says that the question is not valid because the question assumes that I understand what it means when I say God knows. You know, there's a, there's a Hebrew poet, Ibn Virol, who said the following statement, Ilu yedativ hayitiv. What that means is, if I'd know him, I'd be him. The only, the infinite mind can comprehend the infinite mind, and the only infinite mind is God. And even calling him an infinite mind is a wrong description. 
It's just the best we can do using human language. So, so Maimonides says, how could you possibly even ask the question? You're, you're, your assumption is you understand what it means when you talk about God's knowledge. But God's knowledge is inseparable from God himself. In the same way that I cannot possibly comprehend God himself, I can only make statements about what he's not. I can make some statements about his interaction with the world. But to make a positive statement about God's very essence is not possible. And if that's not possible, then I can't even ask the question. Uh, I think I can ask the question, but you know what kids are like? Kids are capable of asking questions to which they cannot comprehend the answer. They do it all the time, right? The kid asks you, why do the leaves fall off the tree in autumn? So what are you going to answer? Depends how old the kid is. Three-year-old asks you that. What are you going to answer? Talk about photosynthesis? Right? And the, and the, the complex carbons and you know, that type of thing and the, and the sugars and the less, less sunlight during the day, so therefore there's less of the photosynthesis going on. Right? I mean, so, so they can't understand the answer. Right? So we are like that. We can't, even understand, we can't even understand the question, let alone the answer. That's Maimonides. Some say that it's, it's a cop-out, but the fact of the matter is it's, it's, it's accurate. It is accurate and it's philosophically correct. There are others who say, the Ralbag, Rabbeinu Levi ben Gershon, Gershonides, known as, he says, God's knowledge and my action happen simultaneously. He says, when does God know what I'm doing? At the moment I do. Because for God, it's all happening in one moment. The entire human history, 14.3 billion, or 6,000, whatever the heck you want, right? All of that, all of history, human history, let's say 6,000, right? All of our history in God's eyes, one moment. It's one moment. Right? The, the, Rabbi Yitzhak al Moshninos has a similar idea. He's got it being outside of time, right? Sees time like a, a friend of my wife described in the following way. You have a hologram. A hologram is like a three dimensional picture, right? Imagine if it had four dimensions, it had time as well. And, and, and you could take a hologram of 20 years of a life. So you could see three, four dimensions, you could see 20 years of your life. That means everything you're doing is all at one moment, from my perspective. So I say, therefore, God hasn't, his, his, his free will hasn't caused it. On the contrary, it's simultaneous. It's a real bug. There are others who say, Raven and others, that God's knowledge is a knowledge which is not, which, in which he has, so to speak, held back the cause of his, this is part of what we call the secret of tzimtzum, the secret of God's concealment in the world, the secret of God's contraction to, 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 uh, to give the possibility of a physical world. Part of that secret of tzimtzum in Kabbalah is the idea that God has also, so to speak, limited the power of his knowledge and has said that his knowledge is not going to control my action. Yes, he knows, but he has limited that. There's a concealment, so to speak, or, a, or a, it's, it's, it's hard to talk about this, but, but, but it's a concealment of God's power, a limitation that he, he does himself so that to allow us the, the, the free will. Uh, ultimately, the Kabbalists say, Ruchayim Vital and others say that ultimately there is the contradiction only exists because we don't see the whole truth of everything. If we would see the truth of everything, we would see there's no contradiction. We're, but, we're, but, but anyway, that's, those are some of the responses to that very famous question. That's a little bit what we've just done, a little bit of an introduction. All right, uh, skimming the surface of the idea of free will in Judaism. The rest is commentary. Go and learn. Um, and uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, we'll see you around. If I may give a plug, um, uh, if you want to hear um, uh, lectures of mine, um, uh, Gateways, we have a seminar, President's Day. Anyone's free President's Day weekend. It's a, it's a holiday which the Jewish protocols, the elders of Zion created um, as a public holiday. Right, in order for Jews to engage in the study of Torah and other things. So if you're free that weekend, look gatewaysonline.com um, and uh, you can certainly speak to the rabbis of Center for a Term. They'll put you in contact with us if anyone's interested. Um, anyone's interested in my book, Gateway to Judaism, it's, uh, it will save you a lot of space at home because you can check out everything else except the Torah. And uh, this is all you need, uh, Gateway to Judaism. So it will expand your house. Um, it's available on Amazon. If you want to hear my lectures, uh, they're free uh, on uh, uh, simpletoremember.com oh, or Torah anytime. Any one of those. Okay. Thank you very much, and it's been my pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Very much.